Welcome to another Under the Hood podcast with Stein Capital Management. My name is Vincent Belagia. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Stein Capital. And today we have with us Mark Jimenez of Cam Investors. Mark, great to have you on Under the Hood. Thank you, Vince. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Great. No, and, and Mark and I have been working together for a few years now. Um, and so he's one of my favorite uh, registered investment advisors that we work with. But Mark, we haven't had really the chance to get into a little bit of the story of Cam Investors, a little bit of your background. So I'd love you to just Give us the story of uh, of how you started, and uh, or or maybe just more about the firm and what you specialize in. So either way you want to start, just let us know. Yeah, no, thanks, Vince. Um, yeah, no, the firm itself, and you know, we are an independent advisory firm. We have three offices. Just the background: okay. um, Austin, Denver, and Tampa, Florida. Mm. You know, we kind of sound bigger than we are. We're a boutique, okay. even though we have three offices, but we have clients really around the country. Um, we do a lot of things for our clients, planning investments and other areas of need. Um, we are a fee-only firm, which means basically that only people that pay us are our clients. Okay. You know, we don't have any uh, in-house commissionable products. We do do a lot of things for our clients, but then send them to experts to help them implement like insurance, estate tax, and things like that. So there's a little bit about our firm. My background is kind of interesting in terms of what I've done um, to get here. I started early in my career doing trading, portfolio management, mm, okay. you know, bonds, options, stocks for big companies, moved into advice, and then um, helped other large companies grow their wealth management groups. Midpoint of my career, I got hired away to go work for an uh, academic institution that really? back then no one really heard about. Now they're pretty popular that offered a specialized type of investment strategy. But my client was no longer the individual family mm. or, or, or a high net worth individual. It became other registered investment advisors like myself today. I see. And so a lot of that goal was, or a lot of that role was helping them um, not just understand how to utilize certain investment strategies, but it was also really about how to think about capital markets, right? Mm. Some of the academic process to understanding capital markets, where sources of return come from, and also helping those advisors better communicate that message to their clients and grow their businesses. So as I was doing that for many years, um, eventually I found my way back to the independent advisor side um, and helping clients. And I really, it's kind of some funny background. I didn't have any desire to ever start my own firm. I was kind of, I was kind of going to wonder about that is like, yeah, because if you're coming from academia and then you, your clients or other RIAs that, yeah, what, what, what's that story like where you actually became, you know, your own independent uh, well, uh, no, good question. So I was, um, after traveling a lot during those years, institution traveling yeah. the country and meeting a lot of great people who are still a lot of my friends today, a lot of what um, they were doing was kind of whispering in my ear, hey, Mark, you know, why don't you ever come back to this side of the business, you know, be yeah. a CIO, help us grow the business. And as I was looking to make that transition back, you know, start a family and grow it, sure. of course, I uh, was going to join some of the, these firms that are now pretty big firms or emerged. And a lot of them said, hey, Mark, you know, you helped us, you helped me grow our firm, helped us grow our firm. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go start your own firm and we'll help you? Yeah. So that was kind of a tell in terms of, okay, maybe I should, maybe I should do it. Um, have an eight-month-old at home. Yeah, made, that's, made, that, that's a think, lot. Yeah. Made you think twice about doing that, but I did it sure. anyways and haven't looked back since. Oh, that's great. And when, when did you start? What year did you start? January of 2017. So we're coming up on seven years here. Great. That's great. Now that's a great anniversary. Yep. And, uh, and, and what, and I guess what was that like? Cause you, you, you know, uh, it's, it's funny. I started my business about the same time when my first child was, was born. So it was like, okay, this is, this is a, a lot of pressure and stress, but was, was it the advice of others or was it felt like kind of something inside you that you needed to try it? Or what, what was that like when you did just start? I think Vince, it was it was a little bit of both. Um, I think it was knowing and understanding the business and working around a lot of great people. Because in in all those roles I had previously, I didn't just have maybe the experience of the technical know how, but mm -hmm. I had a, a good vantage point from seeing other successful advisors who I'd gotten to know. Mm. And it wasn't so much of what to do; it was often a lot of what not to do. Oh, I see. And yeah. learning and learning from their mistakes they shared makes sense. And so having a lot of that, I think, was really valuable and helped me say, "Let's do it." A little extra motivation in the morning, getting up with eight month old helps, sure. yeah. right? Because yeah. you got to you got to make it happen. Got to get to work. The failure rate really is can't be. <laughs> <laughs> there can't be one essentially. That's right. So you you keep going. No, I, I get that. I mean, sometimes it just has to work. So you pour yourself into it. So so seven years ago started. Mm -hmm. Tell and and, and I, I'd love to hear a little bit about the journey, but but let everybody know 
what really Cam specializes in now? Who, who are the people that you serve and, and kind of, you know, you talked about bringing in other professionals to, to help with different pieces, but, but what is it that, that you're really looking for in your clients and who are the people that are, that are best to work with you? Yeah, good question. So like a lot of independent firms, we do a lot of planning uh, investments, but ultimately a lot of our specialty is around more of the advanced planning strategies. Mm. Some of those aren't just tax planning, but a lot of our clients are business owners. Sure. Um, people that have had liquidity events or mm-hmm. are going to have one soon or in the future. Uh, we do a lot of post-IPO work for clients who are coming out of a company that started you know, when they were private, they had stock options, and all of a sudden they woke up and they're like, what do I do now? Mm. So yeah. having them managed not just in the traditional sense of diversifying wealth, but there's taxes. Um, maybe there's some ways to transfer that wealth. Maybe there's some ways to protect that wealth in utilizing more advanced risk mitigation strategies. So we do a lot of those for that audience, and that's a little bit more unique. And I think part of that is because of some of that earlier day background I had in the option markets um, mm-hmm. at the academic <clears throat> institution and knowing kind of how to use different solutions, you know, whether it be public or private or alternatives, to help manage risk better. It makes sense. I know that with several of my entrepreneur friends who have been through maybe a Series A and B and then a C round, they're they're really looking at maybe not a full IPO, but they're looking at taking a lot of cash off the table mm-hmm. or even selling their companies. And I know that there's just a lot of complication that goes into that from a from a planning standpoint and from a tax standpoint. Mm-hmm. So I can see why that's super valuable, especially because you're dealing with usually fairly large numbers. Yep. Uh, a friend of mine's about to to do a buyout for I think. 12 million, then he's have a, has a workout for probably about the same amount. And then another friend of mine is looking probably at about a $60 million sale. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, when, when we're getting into what his tax liability could be as we're just kind of going back and forth, it's significant. And I know, you know, planning on that stuff is super valuable when you're dealing with, with sales like that. Absolutely. I mean, I think anytime you can get in front of that to help someone save money, you always can't, obviously can't wipe it all away, sure. the tax bill. But the earlier you can plan for some of those things, there are some really neat ways that by just planning ahead, you can save those entrepreneurs, people that are coming out of a public uh, or an IPO event, let's say, mm-hmm. you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's, um, it's just, just good planning. But using some of those advanced planning tools does help. Good. That's good. No, it, it, it saves a lot. And and I know that that usually I've seen some people going from from business to business, but some people are having that that one exit or that one IPO and then they really want to take it easy for a while. And I think they want to make sure that with the money that they've made, with the risk that they've taken, like that's going to last. They don't have to worry about money, hopefully, after that. I know that's probably a, mm-hmm. a big deal with you guys too. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, we kind of use the term and joke around the firm. You know, we help clients make work optional. Mm, because, like you know, they, they don't necessarily think about retirement or they don't envision, envision themselves sitting still and sure. not doing anything. So a lot of that process is helping them understand how to make that flexibility in their life happen with time and whatever they want to do. So it's a lot of times we're not trying to hit home runs at anything we do for clients. It's really about sure enhancing their wealth maybe, but also protecting it. Makes right? sense. That's, that's a, most of what we do for our clients. That makes good sense. And then tell me just a little bit more maybe the people at your firm right now, the the, the team that you've built. Um, and, and I know that you've got Austin, Colorado, and and, and Tampa, so, mm-hmm. so three great places. Just give me a little bit more background just on who you have on your team and, and maybe how you divide things up or, or just how the team works together. Yeah, good question. We, we kind of, that was one of the, I think, benefits of starting the firm when I did mm. because we didn't need to have all the infrastructure perhaps a firm that started 20 years ago needed to have. We understood the benefits of technology, uh, benefits of outsourcing mm-hmm. in areas that made a lot of sense benefits of partnering with firms that could help us or work together. And so within those offices, we have those presence more or less, you know, in office space in each. But with clients everywhere, you know, technology is a big part of what we do. Sure. Um, everyone uh, is an advisor, client-facing role. Some wear other hats. You know, I might be the chief investment officer. Somebody might be in charge of client communication. Some might help write the blogs. So we all wear multiple hats, very common in any small business. Sure. But I think a lot of what we're doing is also saying, okay, for compliance, we have to oversee that, but can we partner with an outsourced compliance firm? Mm. You know, we have a tremendous big back office, a multi-billion dollar firm that helps back us up. That's great. So the event, yeah. not just a, a couple of things. One, if we need more resources, we call on them and we use their technology infrastructure that helps us better serve our clients. If we need, you know, cyber, 
protection, which everybody needs. Sure. You know, we have a couple of resources for that. If we need, um, you know, tax professionals, we have a lot of resources that we partner with that may not be directly part of our firm, but we can outsource to or bring in. Um, I think for a lot of our process, you know, we will look to continue to hire, but ultimately, you know, anybody who's actually in the firm is client facing mm. or the clients in some capacity. I like that. I like that. And, and then just working with your firm, you guys have great relationships with your clients, mm-hmm. very personable. And I know they can get a hold of you is like very quickly. And, and that's one thing that's been great when, in working with you guys is that if we can get a hold of you. The, the answers are right there. If you need something from us, we're always just a phone call away. So that it's a big deal. And, I, and, and you have a great team that you work with. So I really appreciate them. Mm-hmm. L- let's, let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the market this year, maybe what your strategies are. It's the end of 2023. Going into an interesting year, you just had you know the Fed make some some comments the other day about what their plans are for rates. But what are the what are the big things you're looking at? Is it is it rates? Is it the market? Is it something outside of that? Just curious what you guys what you guys are thinking about on your side. This is fun for me because um, with our clients, you mentioned you know we like to touch our clients a lot, talk to them a lot, keep them updated. Um, we'll send video messages out, mm. just not because they're necessarily planned, but they relate to current events. Sure. Things that we just, you know, comes to mind, we want to keep our clients updated. And the client's feedback has been tremendous in telling us, Mark, you know, they tell us what we're doing, what they like, but also what they want to see more of. And those updates are are really key and they all like them. Interest rates right now has just been a topic for, I don't know, it seems like 10 years, even though seems it's been, like it. yeah. I mean, it's been for you guys, obviously, you know, sure. you're, you're front and center on that front. Interest rates continues to be just a hot topic because, it impacts so many things. Mm. It impacts not just, okay, you know, borrowing, you know, uh, and money markets, checking accounts, but it impacts uh, ways to invest. As I mentioned before, a lot of that academic framework that I learned over the years, interest rates are a key factor in calculating and understanding how sources of return are created, how they're delivered, and how risk premiums are also mm. you know, delivered to clients yep. and investors. So interest rates is one thing that we are constantly looking at and evaluating. And we're not, in our firm philosophy, we're not forecasters. We don't have a crystal ball. We sure. understand that. But we do like to look at what's in front of us to make well-informed decisions. And so with interest rates right now, you know, they're higher than they were two years ago. Were they, there's a big debate. You know, we've seen this yeah. week a lot of news. Where they're going to be next year, we'll see. We don't try to guess. We just say, let's take advantage of what we know today. Sure, makes sense. And interest rates is, is really important right now because it frames how we invest in a lot of areas. Yeah, and right now, it feels like they're super high, but they're not historically high. They're just a lot higher than they were. But And I think that one of the things that we look at is what that does to asset prices, especially on the real estate side, especially the commercial real estate side, mm-hmm. but then also on the in the market as well, and on the private markets as well, as far as you know, private equity and, and everything else that, that goes with it. So it is interesting, especially because you know these comments did come out that there's an expected you know one, two, or three rate cuts next year. We'll see, right? Um, and I just wonder, and I, I, I get it. You're not trying to predict. We we can't predict either, right? We don't we don't, we don't want to predict asset prices based upon what the Fed may or may not do. Um, but I know a lot of people have been excited. It seems like the market's been a little excited with talks of a cut because they're thinking, okay, is now the time to get in. And I'm not asking that question. It's the time to get in. But I just know that there's a lot of noise about it because the market had such a great run with low interest rates over the last you know, decade or so, really since the GFC. So, um, I, yeah, I guess it makes sense to really look at what's happening. But just, but I am just curious is, are you getting some of that feedback from your clients? Are they asking questions when they hear that? Or are they just kind of waiting and, and seeing as well? Yeah, we, we get a lot of those questions. Um, part of it's because clients are asking them. Part of them are because we may share a message and they'll want to follow up on sure. what we're talking about. They are asking, you know, we, we get the question, you know, it's just, even though they know our philosophy, they're asking us, hey, Mark, should we be doing X? What about next year's strategy? Should we be locking in interest rates now? Should we be buying long-term bonds? Mm. What about stocks, <clears throat> tech stocks? Whatever the question is of the day, we do get those questions. You know, our view is that everything we do on the investment side is driven by what the client needs. Mm. It's driven by their plan. That makes right? sense, yeah. So if a client says, hey, here's my plan, here's my strategy, and it calls for higher risk investments, right? Or they can take more risk and it fits in, we'll go after them. For clients that maybe doesn't call for that, we might pull back. You mentioned the GFC, you know, back in the day. 
one of the things that happened, if you remember, I'm sure, given your business, is that banks sort of did some some bad, right? They did some, yeah, they, some wrongdoing. They did. And they got they the did. handcuffs put on them. What that did, and I think this is where we try to educate a lot of our clients, is it changed some of the framework for expected return in certain asset classes, mm. right? It, but it also opened the door for expected return opportunities, right? And one of those, which is in your world, is in the lending market. Sure. Right? Banks got a little bit handcuffed. They got a little restricted. Um, if you and I, you know, versus 15 years ago, go down and get a personal loan right now, they'll want us to figure, you know, put out a lot of paperwork. It's in play. A lot. It takes a little while. Yeah. You're not getting it, you know, 24 hours. But there's a lot of other resources. We can go online. We can call other private lenders and get money right away. Because of that, GFC, that market has exploded. That's true. Right? And really as of has. last year, if my, my dad is correctly, not just on like small business individuals, but even, uh, you know, private lending, real estate debt lending, um, senior secure lending, that market has surpassed bank lending for the first time as of last year. So that whole marketplace has grown. So that has increased opportunities where we say, look, we can go out and get some of these returns now that were somewhat unattainable just five years ago. Sure. So we spent a lot of time there. Well, let's let's talk about that because I and I know you know you said the the most important thing is to stick with a plan, right? Mm-hmm. To see what assets fit within someone's plan. I, one of the reasons we work together is you guys do use alternative investments, which is different than than a lot of advisors mm-hmm. in the market. Um, what's what's kind of your experience been? And you know, and as you said, this market that really started as kind of a, a niche market, maybe pre GFC now has is, is as big as the banking market, which is pretty crazy to to see these private markets move so much. But tell, just tell us a little bit about your experience because you've been using them for a little while. Just would, would love to hear some stories about what's worked or maybe even what hasn't worked and, and just some lessons learned there. Yeah, I mean, our, our first kind of screen, if you will, for alternatives and whether or not they fit in the client's portfolios, first of all, is it going to add value? Mm. Right, is it going to add value? What I mean by that is, you know, the alternative, let's just take stocks and bonds, basic stocks and bonds that are public. You know, we determine what's the right mix for clients. And we still use public securities across sure. everyone's portfolio. Everyone. Yeah. But as we know, some clients are going to have more stocks, some more bonds. If we start diving into alternatives, we ask, are they going to add value for that client's needs, time horizon, uh, retirement income, whatever it may be? If the answer is no, usually it's a pretty easy, like, okay, we're not using them. Right. But if there's a Answers maybe, then we dive into maybe some of the alternative options we have and how we can apply them to manage risk, perhaps mm-hmm. to smooth the ride out, increase return in areas of like, let's say, sure. fixed income or, or, or retirement income. And so we try to apply that, you know, net of fees, net of taxes to employ alternatives. I think where you asked the question, how we are maybe a little different, that's an area we aren't afraid to go into, mm. you know, because it is a little bit of a, you know, uh, uncomfortable to learn something new sure. in your career and it's easy to get complacent which we're not it's the for, truth and, right? and it's on our website somewhere I'm pretty sure and so <laughs> um, a lot of what we do is we're always trying to learn and understand where we can help our clients right and so Makes it's sense. not just during a pandemic when everything goes to zero in terms of rates before that we felt we needed to go out and start getting other sources of return for our clients just to help them meet their goals sure so that's kind of was our starting point you got us interested. We identified probably a small subset of alternatives because there are a lot of not so good ones out there too. That's the truth. And so right. we typically, you know, most of them we avoid. Sure. Well, and so for the clients that do like, or where, where you're looking at their plan and you're saying, okay, alternatives would be a good mix. It would be good for their portfolio. What are the characteristics of those clients typically? What What do they kind of need that that alts maybe satisfy that need? You mentioned a few things, uh, but what, what are you kind of looking for for those clients? Or what, what are the, what's the characteristic of those clients? Typically, it's going to be for clients that they're no longer in heavy accumulation mode. Okay. That's a pretty common, common denominator. It's clients who don't need to take the highest level of risk. Sure. Because doubling their money or tripling their money is not going to make a change in their lifestyle, but perhaps the other direction will. Right. Right? So it, there's usually some common denominators there. I think it's for people that are also trying to maybe draw income. Mm-hmm. Income's right? a big deal. That's right. Um, that maybe need an extra level of diversification in their portfolio or from what traditional public assets maybe can offer. So 
it's it's a little bit of of helping them meet their planning goals or retirement income goals, but also just really we think managing risk is yeah. the, probably the biggest thing. I think it makes a lot of sense, and and that's one thing that we look at. We're 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 an alt investment provider, of course, but I think it's diversification is a big deal, and and having the investments that aren't correlated with the market, which I think is very helpful. And, and the market has had some rough years, but then has had some excellent years as well. And we just, I mean, our our strategy is just to kind of keep going and doing what we're doing. So sometimes we can be the hero, and sometimes we can be the well. What's you know, you guys are being a little bit slow, and everyone else is doing great. But I think like what you're saying is it just kind of smooths out returns over time. So I, I think that's what, what our clients appreciate. And I hope that that's what your clients appreciate as well when you build your port, these portfolios for them. Yeah. I mean, we're not trying to, again, we're, we, we are a firm that does apply, let's say, certain levels of expected returns, as we call it, to different parts of the market. But really, all we're trying to do is provide the highest level of prob- probability for our clients of meeting their goals, right? And so if it's sure. 8% they need, how are we going to get to 8% or yep. whatever number that is? No, so. it makes a lot of sense. When when you when someone's coming in, um, and and we had mentioned before we started that that you you've got some, you know two two big meetings today um, with some some clients that that have been referred in. Sounds like you could be a great fit. What does that process kind of look like? Someone someone's coming in, they set an appointment with you, but just kind of walk me through maybe some of the discovery pro- process mm-hmm. and and what you're looking for and what makes a great fit for someone to work with you. Yeah. So good question. So. Everything we do, you know, not just on the investment side, but even on the planning side, has a process. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one, it k- keeps everyone organized. Sure. Uh, keeps things compliant. Um, but also, it's transparent for both parties. And so, from day one, from maybe an introductory call, a first in-person discovery meeting, we want to understand as much as possible about somebody. But it also gives our clients a chance to understand what we do and who we are. Because a lot of it isn't just, you know, crossing T's and dot and I's and numbers, a lot of what we do is build in a relationship. Sure. Right? Because in that early, you know, I'll call it one, two or three meetings before they even become a client potentially, there's also some confidence being established. There's some trust being established. So we spend an enormous amount of time understanding all those things, how we can potentially help someone and provide value. At the same time, that prospective client's understanding all those things too, but also like, hey, is is Vince a good guy to work with? Could sure. I could I see myself, you know, working with him for years? Could I see him helping my children? Could he could he be there in case my my spouse has a health ailment? You know, is he going to be that person? So those are the kind of things that come up also in discovery. It's not just the numbers. It's also you know, is that relationship going to be able to accommodate that? Because there's not just milestones as we know in life. There's also things that happen unexpectedly. It's the truth. So a yeah. lot of what we do is try to understand that dynamic early because again, the better we understand that, the better we can help somebody, not just financially, but also perhaps with some of those things that happen early on. That makes a lot of sense. And and I always like to ask this question, Mark, to say when when if someone's looking for a new advisor, a new relationship, um, what are the things that they really need to be looking for? Uh, you know, what what makes it a, a good fit for the client on their side? Just just some advice that you would give. Yeah, I think I think in any relationship not just what we do, because I mean, again, what, what we're doing is trying to make sure that there's a certain level of complexity to be able to provide value and use our skill sets to the best of our abilities. I think in any relationship, there has to be that alignment, right? A mm-hmm. client shouldn't go to somebody that can't deliver, but also they sh- if they can do some of that their s- themselves, they should, right? Makes I think sense, there's, there's, yeah. a, there's a part of that. But I think the questions they need to ask are, you know, how are they compensated, right? What's their investment philosophy? Mm. What's their process to helping clients? Because as we've seen over the years, and we've gotten clients that come to us from other advisors, sure. right, both small and large, it isn't about the financial planning wasn't done well or the investments maybe weren't done poorly. It was just the communication mm. uh, wasn't clear. The service wasn't great. Um, and that has to do with probably the process to managing or maybe they had 300 clients per advisor and it was impossible to service. Too many. yeah. So... All those questions about, you know, philosophy, how are you compensated? How many clients do you serve? What's your process for serving clients? What's your process for reviewing clients uh, situations? Sure. On not just a one-time, but an ongoing basis. Those are just some basic things. And other things also about, hey, what happens if you, Vince, get hit by a bus? Who do I work with, right? Continuity planning. You know, we have one in place. 
it's there from day one when I started the firm by myself because I knew that question. If it didn't come up, I wanted it to be very transparent. Yeah, that's an important question. On what would happen because a lot of times that isn't always addressed. No, no, that's a great idea. No, that's good. That's, that's really helpful, I think, for people to, to think about and evaluate. Um, the, the, when, and I want to kind of go back to some of the business owners because I know you work with a lot of business mm-hmm. owners and entrepreneurs, especially with those that are kind of in that transition time. For, for, those, for those people that, that are in that situation, what are the things that they really need to be thinking about uh, as a, a sale or, or maybe a new round is coming? We're in Austin. We have, we have a lot of people in the tech space. We have a lot of people in the real estate space. And uh, it just seems like those business transactions are happening all the time. Maybe maybe slow down a little bit with some of the higher interest rates, a little bit hard to, to maybe finance out of it. But still, what what do, what do those people really need to be thinking about uh, as they're making a transition? I think it'd be pretty valuable. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, the, the obvious one's going to be taxes. Okay. Um, you know, waiting till the year before you go to market and sell a business, probably... Is late, a little late, um, yeah. you know, unless it's something that just happened to be fortuitous. But typically, taxes are a big one you want to start planning for because a lot of business owners need to realize that if you're going to have, let's say, a capital gain of any size, there's things you you can be doing several years in advance to help plan for that and to reduce that, right? For sure. any type of structure, um, if you're coming out of a stock option or IPO, there's things you can be doing ahead of time to plan for those exits. So exit planning as it relates to tax, tax planning in other areas is important. That's one thing we see up and down. Also understanding, is your capital being used wisely? We come across so many cases where, I mean, business owners are running the business. Sure. They're not- We're, we're good at running a business. That's what we know how to do. Hopefully, they're, right? They're not spending time on managing a small business 401k plan for their staff. Yeah. Although there's a tax benefit. They're not spending time on re- investing cash wisely, but that can produce returns that are greater for the business or themselves. So there's things that we see tax planning. We see things that um, how to invest cash flow that are very common. Um, also just the risk, the key man, right? Mm, Understanding yeah. what happens. Because I mean, we see the data. Sometimes things don't go as planned. How do you sure. manage risk to an owner when there's one or multiple? So those are the things that they're not easy conversations for some, but we have to have them. Because it comes up. One thing you'll probably hear more of coming up is a state tax. Hmm. There's some rules that were put in place several years ago where the exemptions are pretty, pretty large. Right. That could change here in a year or two when they sunset, as they call it. We don't know the amounts, but if they even come down a little bit, that's going to impact a lot of business owners who have you know, equity value on their balance sheet. Sure. And so there's things like that that we try to address or get in front of too. That's a great idea. And, and and all that would be taken care of really as, as part of maybe that intake and discovery process, I would assume, that as someone's coming in. Absolutely. What, so if I go back to something, we talked about interest rates, right? Where there's there's uh, there's maybe some of these state taxes that, that are going to be applicable to some people. Is there anything else that, that's just kind of on your radar of just kind of paying attention to or you're thinking about and and maybe you're waiting to see what happens, but just curious. To, uh, I'm always curious with with advisors, uh, especially someone who's, who's the chief investment officer of what's on the radar uh, besides the two big things. Anything else come up for you? Yeah. So this is um, this is where my mind, you know, being a student of the business and just in liking this stuff, so it's easy for me to stay on top of it. Sure. You know, although we do have a lot of great partners like yourself and others who keep us up to date on market updates and trends and data. Um, but one of the things, in addition to post GFC that this private lending market, mm-hmm. all things call, we'll call it lending, has really expanded upon. That's presenting opportunities that otherwise weren't there again a few years ago. So we are in that space, as you know, and we like it a lot. The other thing, which is sort of related, is looking at just the global equity markets. And I'm mm-hmm. going to get a little academic here. Oops, excuse me. I'm going to get a little academic right. here. Put, put your academic head on. We're good. We're good, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to get a little, little, little uh, you know, left brain here, as they say. So... One thing that a lot of investors don't know, and it's, it's okay because it's not their job to know, is that the number of companies going public is smaller, is less mm. Interesting. than it used to be. There's a reason for that. There's regulation, you know, there's costs, Sarbanes-Oxley, there's a lot of stuff that on why that is. Also, why a lot of companies are maybe not going public or waiting is because, as we talked about earlier, they don't need to go to the capital markets for money. The Makes private sense. market 
is tremendous. Think about companies like Airbnb, Spanx, a few other ones that tap the private markets for years. And use an example to kind of put some numbers in perspective. Think about Microsoft, and they went okay. public. I think they were about 700 million or so market cap. All right. You know, a lot of companies now are going public at 100 billion, 200 billion, huge, 300 billion. Huge numbers, yeah. And some of them, no one knows who they are, but they've been doing just fine. They hit a point where maybe it made sense. But the reason I bring that up is that there's a risk premium when Microsoft goes from 700 million to what it is today that investors can earn. Sure. But if companies are going public later, you can argue that there's a gap there of when they were a smaller company that public investors maybe couldn't earn. Now, you don't know which in advance because actually most public companies don't make a lot of money every year or, or, or they don't perform well. But it's hard to advance. So there's a way to diversify that risk a little bit. But as far as keeping returns or achieving returns going forward, you may have to think outside the box a little bit or maybe something different to achieve or get exposure to those companies that are waiting to go public until later. That's really interesting because that, that's just it is, is the markets have changed. And, and, uh, and, and it was, it was kind of like, here's a series, here's a series, here's a series, and maybe there's an IPO and, and you do get a much smaller company that comes in the market. But it seems like private equity now has got so much capital coming into those and, and essentially just keeping them private for longer. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that many of those discussions on the podcast where there just may not be that opportunity to go buy one of those, say, diamonds in the rough that becomes, you know, an, a, an amazing gem down the line because you know the private markets have taken a piece of that already in a lot of that process. Right. So, and it doesn't mean those companies can't still be good and keep growing. Sure. Larger, but there is that evidence, you know, in academia that shows, you know, from when these companies became the little tiny ones and went from the, you know, the little tiny public companies of ten million dollars of market cap, all the way up to, you know, hundred billion. That's a good return for investors, you know. And, and there's evidence to show how much that produced towards like an S and P 500 return over that lifespan or some other index. Without that, and, and who's to say that won't continue through other mechanisms? But knowing that it's happening, right? There's that delay. That's why you're seeing, in my opinion, a lot more rise to new funds and the private equity, private debt, private real estate debt, private real estate. You know, all things that's happening because. Um, there's opportunities to provide that. Now, you got to be careful because there's some bad actors too, but that probably will continue. It makes it makes a lot of sense. And, and I think it also, I think that's why there has been such a draw to those private markets because of the returns that are. That's why we've been in the private markets mm -hmm. for a while. Of course, we're more of a stability play than, than a you know 10x play. But it does make a ton of sense uh, as to why you see the performance where we have in the public markets, but then so much opportunity in the private markets. That's what someone was, I was reading an article, I guess, about the Russell 2000, saying the Russell 2000, which is really those those smaller and uh, public stocks that hasn't had the performance that's had in the past because of that reason is that is that companies just aren't coming on with the type of headroom to grow like they have in the past. But but pretty fascinating uh, mm -hmm. discussion there on that. Good good to know. Um, tell me, uh, uh, if we go back to Cam for a second, um, what is it that that sets you guys apart? We talked about relationship. We talked about uh, some legacy. Um, but what is that? What is that Cam Investors legacy uh, for you? What What does it mean to you as the as the owner and founder? Um, good question. I, I think there's probably a couple parts to that. Um, you know, I grew up in a client service business. Mm -hmm. My whole life, I've always been in some sort of client service business, whether it's been institutional, you know, working for large companies, helping individuals, families. So that's just what I like to do. Um, I think a lot of what I like to see and why I show up every day to work is just helping people, right? Again, yeah. I'd argue some of the planning and investing techniques are regimented in my, in my way of thinking and I just do them automatically. But what causes me to stop each day, you know, one of the meetings today, um, Discovery, you know, one of the individuals shared about her mom, right? And I said, hey, is there anybody that you might have to take care of yeah. or support? And, and she said, you know, I actually am doing that right now and, and mm -hmm. for these different reasons. And, you know, and she got, you know, a little bit, you know, uh, it, was, it was emotional. Yeah, I understand that. And I, so... Mom, it's mom after all, right? Yeah, and, and it's understandable because you can, you know, envision where they're coming from, you know, with, with family. So a lot of those things, I think, you know, 
don't keep me up at night, but keep me thinking about, you know, more and more clients, whether they're existing or new, are going to face some of these things that they need somebody, right? It's not going to be necessarily find the right investment fund. I mean, there's always those things too, but it's going to be sometimes just being there yeah. to help them through those processes. Because I know, you know, if if I wasn't here, I think, what would my parents do? Sure. Right. What would yeah. my parents do? And and I, I think that's thought. where that's where I think there's there's you know some people say, well, the advisor business is changing. Well, of course, it's always everything's always changing, but that advice component, I think, and kind of helping people through life's challenges seems like it's only <laughs> increasing the more you get into someone's life yeah. and planning uh, opportunities. Um, that's a lot of where I think I like to see us do more of for clients. Well, that makes a big difference because I've, I've had advisors that I've worked with that have been about, here's the investment allocations, here's some things that I'm thinking about, and then, you know, we'll, goodbye, we'll, we'll see you, you know, next year or whatever that might be. But I think really you know, interacting with clients' lives. That, that's one place that, that we could really improve with, mm-hmm. right, on our side. We're, we're not in the same business, but uh, making a difference in people's lives and, and providing for those things that are unexpected. And typically those things that are unexpected are difficult. They can provide a huge disruption. And having someone that someone can trust to walk them through and just, just help them through the difficult times, that's a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's almost like um, I just thought about something that, I did, you know, during the pandemic in my basement up in Colorado when I was, we were living there full time <laughs> and, uh, you know, an interesting time for sure. You had a lot of time to think yeah. and keep yourself busy sometimes. But I know one of the things I did, I had a, an idea from somebody else on this, but it was really about kind of what would you, what would you tell future investors, right? What would you tell future investors if you had to send like a message or a video or a letter and like, kind of like start off this video and I did it, you know, not... I don't do much social media um, and to this degree, but I did because again, I had some time. Sure. And it was about, you know, dear future investor. It was, it started out, remember that time, right? When you, and you bought your first stock, you bought your first bond, you bought your first house, you know, you paid for that first wedding mm. you paid for that first college tuition payment for your child, you know, your child. So it went down that path. And I always think about that video because as I shared it with some clients thinking that they would be kind of, Maybe cheesy or wouldn't make sense. The feedback was, I'm showing this to my son right now. I'm showing this to my daughter right now because I think they see the value in kind of trying to educate their own families, Mm. right? And so I think a lot of what we're trying to do is be an education first approach and help them understand how all these tools, all these things that we offer can help them, but still making sure that they're doing the right thing along the way. So that's that that was something I thought about when you said that. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to still help people do that. Oh, there is. There, there, there's a ton. And, and, uh, and I do love the, the education component that you guys have. And then just the relational component that you guys have. I, I want to make sure, Mark, that people know how to get a hold of you. Just tell, tell them where they can find you, how they can call you, and, and anything that would be helpful there. Yeah, so we are online at caminvestor.com. That's our website. There's different ways. You can go online and schedule an introductory call. You can go uh, email us. And we'll set up a follow-up call. Um, you can just go on and read some of our blog. I always tell people, go check out our blog, check out our recommended books online, and maybe something will resonate there. You know, because again, like most advisory firms, you know, we don't help everybody. Sure. And I always tell people if you're not sure, because a lot of clients, I mean, 95% of our new clients all come from current client referrals. Mm, that's great. And so we always tell people, don't worry about if we're a good fit or not. If for some reason we're not a good fit, we'll make sure that they find somebody who is in our network. Mm. right? In case there's yeah. a better alignment. So website, communications on there, you can find us there, reach out. We can definitely follow up with you. Right. Well, we've been working with Mark for a number of years. We trust him. We can see the relationships that he has with his clients. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, and, uh, and and when you have 95% of your business come in from the clients that you already have, that says a lot. So Mark, thank you for being on Under the Hood uh, a lot of great information. Thanks for sharing the the Cam story and uh, just being a part of what we do at Stallion. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Perfect timing. Anything else? Yeah, right. So I say, anything else that you wanted to kick in there that we can always edit the things in? Uh, anything else you wanted to focus on? No, I mean, on? is there anything that you wanted? I mean, I, I think we covered. No, I, I think that was that was the good stuff, man. I thought that was a good session. I think that, yeah, I think the private lending market's good, you know, for you guys too, because that market's just gotten big. And, yes. um, the risk premium, I think, again, it's a little academic for some, but I th- there's some merit to, I think, why we continue to go down that path m- more because you're just seeing that happen with less companies or they're delayed on their... I mean, because think about it, I mean, 
doesn't matter whether you're a big lender or small to those companies, why would you want to subject yourself to public oh. company requirements and reporting? It's so much, so much work, especially now. And, I, and you know, you, you mentioned Microsoft, but I was thinking about Dell at the same time. Yeah. Saying, you know, that's kind of the Austin story of, you know, a small computer company that went public and then boom. Remember their stock price was doubling, 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 and you know, eventually kind of hit their their size and their peak. But uh that's that's always the Austin company I think about. I mean the IBM liquidity too. factor is that eventually for some of these firms they have to go public, but if they can stay off the radar, I mean, um, you know, as long as they can. It's it's just it's fascinating because I think even for like some of these companies, right? Or you and I, like I'll happily go to another institution for money if I can get it tomorrow and and then I'll pay it back. But I have to go to the bank and wait 30 to 45 days and deal mm. with all that. I don't have time for that. Oh, it's a pain. I mean, it was like, it was, I guess the last time I I financed a house um, and it was it was through Regions Bank. I mean, the level of scrutiny was unbelievable and, and took, I don't know, 60 days probably to close the oh, transaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a colonoscopy basically. <laughs> I mean, I not to be, use that term, but that's. Ba- I, I mean, did. we just did that off-market property in in August and got it, and uh, oh god, it was like, it was stuff that I got asked fourteen times the same yeah. question different ways. It's like, what was this transaction for five thousand dollars in this account? You know, nine months ago. I was like, like, I don't remember. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> it's like, uh, does it matter? It doesn't really matter, but I guess to someone it does, man. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't I, anything that else you think that we should add, um, but I think we covered. Timmy, any, anything you think we should go into? No, no, I think we touched on some major stuff. You know what? Let me, let me hit one thing. I want to talk about income for just one second. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll go into it. We'll just kind of ask some questions about how important is in, is income right now for your clients? And then kind of what are you guys doing to, to help with that for people that maybe are not in the accumulation phase anymore? Uh, we'll go for this. So I'll just start from them. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, to income. So there's different ways that we think about income. You know, some investors like to be total return. Some investors, which means just grow the portfolio and take your own dividends. Right. Uh, but a lot of people like the income generation because they can align it with their ongoing expenses, lifestyle needs, yeah. year over year. Um, we have both types of investors. For income, though, you know, we we like solutions that generate higher income yield, whether it's monthly or quarterly. Um, you know, like your fund, for example, it generates a solid dividends, which support income that may come in addition to, let's say, treasuries they might own or other sure. traditional public fixed income. So that's a good compliment. Clients like to see income because in their minds, maybe that it's not spending down principal. We try to educate, hey, it's a matter of the whole picture you want to consider, your whole portfolio. But in some cases, if we can generate enough income off existing balance sheet items, then great, let's take advantage of it. And we, and we, we look at that. I mentioned earlier interest rates. You know, Our planning process is dynamic. It's not something that we just make it static. We don't take historical numbers and assume they're going to be the same going forward because that's a little risky. Right. So what we do is we say, look, our process looks at everything each year at a minimum. Interest rates, inflation, you know, market returns, client circumstances to determine what that level of income is that's available that we can generate, sure. what the client needs, and is it still aligned with their overall plan or retirement income strategy. But income is important for a lot of our clients. And again, we've... Our clients have heard me say it on the video messages, take advantage of the yield while it's here because these yields are attractive, they're here, or lock in something that you know you're going to stay in that range even if rates were to come down. We don't know if they will, but if they do, you know, you'll wish you had more of the higher yielding instruments. That's the truth. And, and I think for a lot of our clients, same thing is, is what we talked to them about is if we can generate enough income off the assets that you already have to where you're not having to draw down on them, then you're just reducing risk for for further down in the, in the days ahead, right? Mm-hmm. I'd rather, rather you keep that principal number uh, about what it is or maybe even add to that. Mm-hmm. But if you can pull enough income to, to live the lifestyle that you really want, that's always one of our goals in, in the distributions that we're providing as well. Yep. So. Absolutely. And one thing too, um, what we've seen witnessed in the last couple of years, especially with rates moving around quite a bit to the upside or all over the place sure. is that there's a lot of assets that aren't designed to sustain interest rate volatility, mm. no matter how safe they might be perceived to be. And there are assets that are better at managing that risk. So whether rates are going up or down, the principal may not be moving much, but the income's still coming out. Yeah, There's a lot of instruments and, and a lot of 401k 
account holders with large balances, for example, we've seen the last few years, the last two in particular, who maybe were invested in safe funds, because that's all the only options they had, right. lost a lot of money just because rates were going up. Right. And there wasn't a good option. So we've seen a lot of that, or we've seen clients or new clients come to us with ways to diversify that risk. Because we don't know what direction interest rates, you know, we, don't know. we, could, have, we could have a lot yeah. of things happen, you know, here that change next year or the year after. So that's one thing that in designing income strategies, we also want to be mindful of principal volatility. No, I appreciate that. And and it, it is a big deal for your clients. Same same thing with ours. And we don't know which way interest rates are going to go. We 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 have some map, maybe a Fed dot plot, but we'll <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how accurate that is to reality. Well, again, Mark, thanks for coming out. Great discussion. Can't can't uh, wait to catch up and have you or maybe